Learning Ally is a proud sponsor of the Empowered Dyslexia podcast. Learning Ally, a nonprofit education organization, helps to transform the lives of struggling learners by delivering proven solutions that help students reach their potential. We have a heritage of supporting students with a reading deficit like dyslexia. Our award-winning Human Red audiobook solution helps students in grades 3 through 12 access books they want and need to read to help them succeed. Visit www.learningally.org for more information. The following content is not intended as a substitute for professional legal advice, medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your attorney, advocate, physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding any medical or educational concerns. Hello and welcome to Empower Dyslexia. I'm your host, Stephen Yearout, and on this show, we're here to help you become a better informed partner in education. We speak about dyslexia and other related disorders. We speak about intervention, research, uh, special education policy at the local, state, and federal level. We also talk to experts in their field. And like today's show, we talk to people who have personal stories uh, around learning disabilities and struggles and and how they have uh, dealt with it. I want to make sure that we always ask our viewers and listeners to like us on Facebook and YouTube, subscribe, leave us a comment. We always love to hear from you. If you like to listen to our audio version, as you can see, we're on every app that you could possibly imagine to get your favorite podcasts. So today, <clears throat> I've been trying to get this guest on the show for a long time now. Um, I was introduced to our next guest uh, through a friend of mine, and I was blown away when I saw his um, artwork. Um, his name is George E. Miller II. Uh, he has spent over 20 years illustrating and public speaking. Uh, he, his artwork is around multi, multicultural child advocacy, and his, his artwork is beautiful. And, I mean, just the depth of meaning behind uh, all of the pieces is exactly what our country needs. And, I mean, his artwork has, has been in... Uh, major motion production films like um, It Takes a Village, It Takes an Entire Village to Raise a Child is one of his pieces, and it was in the movie The Preacher's Wife with Denzel Washington. And I reached out to uh, George E. Miller II, and I, I was just amazed to hear his story, listen to his passion, and you know, I, I had to have him on the show. So welcome, George. Thank you, Stephen. Happy to be here. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, who George is and, you know, why, why did you pick this topic of child advocacy as um, your artwork? Okay. Thank you for that. Uh -huh. I've been creating artwork, as you said, for well over 20 years, uh, probably a little closer to 30. I uh, began creating artwork as a little boy, just for myself. I had some issues, some learning issues growing up. Uh, I had my issues were more around my hearing. So I had difficulties uh, with hearing. It wasn't diagnosed until later on into almost, uh, I think, the fourth or fifth grade, the, the problems that I was having were based on my hearing. 
I had to go to speech classes because of I wasn't hearing correctly. When you don't hear correctly, you don't speak correctly. And uh, in turn, that made me a bit of an introvert. So I wasn't out there like the rest of the kids were. I was more into myself. I was more inverted. I, and I spent a lot of time just creating artwork, drawing pictures. It was something that relaxed me, that made me feel good. Uh, I wasn't as good as the other kids in things like math and reading and science. And so a lot of times I would sit in class and draw pictures or I would daydream and stare out the window or things like that. Uh, drawing became my, my go-to thing. It made me feel comfortable. So I drew pictures all the time. They say if you put in 10,000 hours into anything, you become pretty good at it. And I think my 10,000 hours started kind of early on in life. So I started creating artwork just for my own self, a place for me to go. As I got older and, uh, and had to go out and find jobs and work and, and make a way for myself, my first job, I worked at a post office, and I I did my postal work, but it kind of got out that I drew pictures. And so people ask me all the time, uh, can you do a picture of my grandkids? Can you do a picture of so-and-so who's retiring, things like that? I did a stint in the Air Force, and it was the same way. Uh, can you do a picture of Sergeant so-and-so who's retiring? And it just kept going. It, it followed me everywhere I went. I couldn't get around it until uh, one day I decided that um, I was going to take a chance and see if I could do this for a living. So it was scary in the beginning, and it was tough. My father, who had worked at the post office and retired from the post office when he found out that I had quit the post office to draw pictures he kind of hit the ceiling I can imagine yeah you would have thought I was a 15 year old who had just wrecked the car or something what are you doing you don't quit your job to draw pictures and everybody that I knew basically thought I was doing the wrong thing and so that made it a little tougher too. But that also uh, made it a challenge for me that I could do this, that I could make this happen. And I think that people who have learning disabilities and challenges like that learn to go inside of themselves and find a little bit more than what people who have it a, a little bit easier tend to stay on the surface. So I was able to go in deeper and, and when things would get tough, I would just go in deeper. And I think that's pretty much what allowed me to get to where I'm at today. I, I kept trying, I just felt like I can, I can do this. That's been my blessing, it's kind of be your curse and your blessing at the same time. I would encourage anyone who has dyslexia, and I told you earlier I don't know a lot about it, but I know it, it's, it makes your life difficult. It's yeah, so, you know, like, like we had talked earlier, on this show we don't just talk about dyslexia because the same feelings that you felt from having hearing problems and the struggles that then occurred in school because of the hearing problems, we go through the same things. Um, and actually, for a long time, people thought that dyslexia was a hearing problem. A lot of times, people thought, if there was in the past, people thought dyslexia is an eye problem. You can't see the things correctly. You can't hear it correctly. And you know, out of the, you know, almost 140 years of research, we, we know that that's not the case. So, you know, when I um, first looked at your artwork, 
I mean, the meanings behind those pieces, they were, they just jump off the page for me. I mean, I can see exactly what you're trying to say without ever knowing what you're trying to say, right? <laughs> I mean, for the first time, I really saw art in a way that I hear other people talk about art, right? right. You know, they, they, people look at a famous painting and they're like, oh, this means such and such, such and such. But I was able to look at your artwork and go, this is what he was talking about. This is what he meant. So, <clears throat> your one of your paintings uh, won a contest, right? Um, the several different ones. Well, I mean, <laughs> one in Florida mm -hmm. that that hung in the the governor's mansion, right? That's right. That's right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I sure can. So each one teach one, bring down the walls of illiteracy. So I was at home one day and I got a phone call. And uh, the lady on the other end of the phone said, "George, this is this is First Lady Ann Scott." And I said, "Who?" And she, <laughs> she said, "This is First Lady Ann Scott. This is the governor's wife. The governor at that time was Rick Scott, and Ann Scott had been the one that was going to select the artists of the year for the state of Florida in 2015." And she said, George, I selected your artwork. I want you to be the African-American Artist of the Year for the state of Florida in 2015. And that was pretty amazing in itself. She said, I selected your artwork, George, because so much of your artwork has to do with reading and learning. And I feel that reading is the foundation of all learning. And I fell in love with your piece, Each One Teach One, Bringing Down the Walls of Illiteracy. And that's the piece that I would like to hang up in the governor's mansion. So that was an uh, extremely great honor for me, uh, probably the biggest honor that I've had. That's a uh, kind of great piece for me. It's like you were saying, it, it's extremely diverse. Uh, multicultural piece of artwork. The adults are in a library and they are handing books down to the children, to the young people. And uh, it just had a lot of meaning to me. It just took me where I wanted to be or where I felt like our community needed to be to take the reading serious and to understand uh, how, how big a deal it is. If you kind of if you kind of step back and look at the artwork, uh, the it kind of makes a heart shape in the shape that everyone is kind of encompassed in. And that's the love that I wanted to show in the picture. I wanted all children. I wanted different ages. I just was trying to include everybody the best I could. And that's the picture that I came up with. I mean, I, I, when I look at that, I, I, I come away with a couple things. Um, number one, it's passing how important it is to pass down knowledge, mm -hmm. right? And the books are knowledge. Mm -hmm. And to pass that knowledge down also ties into loving that child, loving that person. We pass on knowledge to the people that we care about and we love. Um, and you are correct. The reading is, reading and spelling is the foundation for who we are. You know, we as a, as a people have lost the storytelling um, part of our existence because we always used to get all of our history from storytelling mm -hmm. and we don't do that anymore. Now it's all through printed text. Mm -hmm. And if we can't read, if our children can't read, well then they lose all of that. All right. You know, through our words, through that printed text, we live on forever. Right. right? That's right. That's how we live on forever. So we have to make sure that our, children can learn to read so that they can then pass that on, pass on who we are after we're gone. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Uh, that's without a doubt. So I, I think you're right. That piece kind of takes all that in. The overall message is love one another. And when we teach our kids we are loving our children, it's a very important piece. I think that piece should hang up in every school across the country. A lot of times when we can't read, the images, the, the picture tells a thousand words. The images will say it all. And so we have to have artwork like this around uh, for everyone. It helps, helps us all learn. Well, the, you know, the other piece that we as dyslexics struggle with a lot of times is the mental imagery. So we, we may be remediated to the point where we can uh, read the words on the page, but we can't build that mental imagery, that picture uh, that you're painting. We can't mm -hmm. build that in our minds, so we can't put it all together mm -hmm. for that comprehension piece. Mm -hmm. So that's part of all of this. You learn to read, right. and then you read to learn. And then you read to learn. Okay. Excellent. So um, you're a public speaker. Mm -hmm. You go to um, school systems, IS, you know, ISD school systems, and talk to uh, the principals, administrators, and you know, discuss your artwork and programs like that. I like, I like more than that to talk to the kids and to show my artwork to the kids. And if you look closely in a lot of my artwork, there are actually words hidden or camouflaged into the picture. So the piece, each one teach one, bringing down the walls of illiteracy has a book card and the word read is on the book card, R-E-A-D. Um, love one another is hidden in the wood grain on the floor and words are hidden on the bookshelf and I like the kids to look for those I, I have a science picture where I hid the names of the planets I have a social studies picture where I hid the names of the continents and I like the kids to look for those and see if they can find them some of the kids have a great time with that I can hear them right now they say give us another one Mr. Miller give us another one and so I have a lot of fun talking with the kids. I rather spend my time talking with the kids a lot more so than the adults. But um, if I feel like I have some message that I can bring to them, then I like to share that with the adults as well. I, uh, and, uh, I am in a unique um, position that I get to I get to interact with a lot of different organizations that are there to advocate for children in a lot of different ways. So we talked about a piece called Protecting America's Children. I created that for the Florida Network of Child Advocacy Centers, and they're an organization that's put together to uh, combat child abuse prevention. And so... Um, I get to meet and interact with people like them, the Safe Place Network. They set up safe places all across the country in order to uh, young teenagers, young people who are maybe runaways or just looking and need a safe place to go to, they can go to the side of this building and they'll see their logo, um, which says safe place, it's bright yellow, and they know that they can go in there and be taken care of. So I get to meet a lot of wonderful people that, who have devoted 20, 30 years of their lives to helping kids from everything from dropout prevention to autism to you name it. And I am in a wonderful position. I like to share that with other adults because I like to let them know I like to let them know when when you watch the news you you imagine that we are in a losing battle that everything is bad and there's so much negative out there but I can reassure you that there's a lot of good people out there doing a lot of great things for a lot of good people and this is across the country I, I live in Florida but I travel from Las Vegas to here in Texas to DC. I go all over the country and there are good people all over the country doing everything they can to make life better for our kids in all, in all aspects. So I like to talk to, about that to the adults 
to the kids, I like to get a little more personal and a little more fun and laugh with them. But for adults, I want them to know that we're not losing. No matter what you see on the news and how bad it looks, we are winning this thing. And right. We just have to keep going, keep fighting, never give up. And we have a we have a um, we have kids that are out there that are begging for these these interactions. These people that are out there that are supporting these kids. These kids are waiting for that interaction. They're begging, please come back, come back, come back. Um, and we can't. I mean, that's the reason why we do what we do. We can't stop. Yeah. Yeah. They're our future. We have to be here. For we them. we have to be here for them. Um, they can't do it without us. They need us. It, it, people like to talk about how resilient kids are, and and I believe they they are resilient to a certain extent. But all of us need help. We need to learn to ask for help. Young people need to learn to ask for help and. And then us as adults, we need to learn how to seek out those that need help. Um, there's a quote that talks about um, uh, if we treat people as they ought to be, then we help them to become what they are capable of becoming. When I see you and I know that you have a learning disability and you're not living up to what I know you can do and who I know you can become, then it's my responsibility to take you in and guide you and help you to see and let you know that, Stephen, you can be so much. You can, you can change the world on your own, but you don't know that. I can see it in you, so it's up to me. It's my responsibility to make sure that you see and know that. Absolutely. I mean, we talk about um, we want to make sure that our kids can be the best version of themselves and that our kids can um, have the support that they need so they can be, like you were saying, the live up to their potential that they know they can be. Because we all know, you know, the people with learning disabilities, we know that we're smart enough to be X, Y, Z. We just don't know why we can't get there. We don't know why we're struggling so much to get to this point, but we know we're capable of doing that type of work. Mm -hmm. And at some point, like you were saying, you were talking about how kids are resilient. Let's don't waste that resiliency over something that we can prevent. Allow that resiliency to be reserved for later in life because life is going to hit them, right? right. Let's let them use that resiliency later. Let's give them the support now. Um, I want to talk about some of your, your artwork. Um, caught reading. I love this <laughs> this uh, picture. Mm -hmm. That's my niece, Brina. So uh, I lived in Los Angeles for a spell, and my niece, Brina. Uh, Ziggy, can we bring that up, caught reading? Okay, thank you. She would, she would always come up kind of missing like where's Brina at where's Brina and then when you find Brina she's sitting in a corner somewhere reading one of her books and I just thought that was so nice and special so I wanted that's my salute to Brina I, I, a, there's so much that comes out to me in this picture one because as a dyslexic the library was a place of torment for me mm because I knew I couldn't get anything out of it, right? It might as well have been a haunted house for me because I, wow. there wasn't anything I could do in there. So I see that. I always wanted to read. I always wanted, and there, uh, as most dyslexic, we always wanted that information. We wanted to be able to go in there and, and, and take advantage of all the knowledge that's in there. And I see her sitting in the corner there with a big smile on her face with a book in her hand, and it just makes me happy. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that somebody gets it. Somebody, um, a child like that is, is able to to have such a happy place being able to sit there and read. Mm -hmm. that, that, that has got to be a, a terrible feeling to, to not be able to get out of the books uh, 
what's been put in there for you to obtain. I think a lot of times the illustrations, you know, are, are very much helpful for books, you know, and, and that uh, when I look at children's books, oftentimes the illustrations mean so much more than the words. I think we want to teach our kids to use their imaginations as much as possible. I think Albert Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge. And so we, we can uh, play games to help our kids grow their imaginations. And imagination can take you a long way in life. So I don't know if you ever played this game when you were a kid. But we played a game where the kitchen floor or the dining room floor was made of lava and it's hot. And so you climb, you got to climb across the couch. You, you have to play this game when your mom's not home. So you climb across the couch to the chair to this because if you step on the floor, then you just burned in the lava. And so, and so to me, whoever won that game was, wasn't the most athletic it was the one with the greatest imagination who saw the lava bubbling up and definitely didn't want to step into that lava so we grow our kids imagination when you look up at the clouds and you played this game with your parents and what do you see in the clouds and and the more things that you're able to see in the clouds you you are actually exercising your imagination you're building that mental imagery that I was talking about. You're building that mental imagery, and that can carry you a long ways. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully, and all our children and will learn to read until they can. It, maybe we can guide them at least a little with the illustrations and the imagery. Yeah, and I mean, the great thing now, we have audiobooks. You know, we can, you know, one of our sponsors on the show is Learning Ally, and they have human read audiobooks and like 80,000 different titles. So these kids can tap into that while they're going through remediation. So, you know, technology definitely has played a, a huge role in helping support these kids while they're going through remediation and learning to read. Oh, that's um, which comes up to your next, your next uh, painting, The Joy Reading. The Joy Reading. So the little girl right there in the middle with the red barrettes in her hair and the red blouse on is actually my daughter, Joy. So Joy now is 22 years old. So it kind of gives you an idea how long I've been doing that. And she's surrounded by her friends and they are finding joy in being together and reading. There's a quote that's the caption underneath the artwork that says good books like good friends uh, bring us much joy. So I, I hear you and I'm sorry that you or anyone would miss out on that joy that comes with reading. It, and th that's, a, that's a travesty. That's about the most devastating thing I think a child can deal with growing up as a young person. And so we have to find ways it's funny, uh, when I am in my art studio creating, I listen to audio books. Obviously, you can't create a piece of artwork and read at the same time, so I'll pop in an audio book. When I first go into my art studio in the morning time, I don't want any sound. The only sound that I hear uh, is sketching out ideas. It's the sound of the pencil on the paper. But once I know what it is that I want to create, then I can let go of that part of me that, that is, is grabbing on to the, the creativity. And then just the natural flow of creating happens. And I can pop in a book on tape. And that's what I do. I listen to books on tape while I create the artwork. So I know it. Because of audiobooks, you know, I've first finished, uh, I say I first finished, I finished my first book, cover to cover, listening to audiobooks, uh, when I was 44. It was the first time that I'd ever listened or read to an entire book. Wow. Wow. So, you know, 
we we will get to the point where all kids can read because that's what we're fighting for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you have dyslexia or not, if it's dystichia, uh, meaning the the school system, you know, they they don't have um, their their teachers aren't trained in the science of reading or how to really teach. Mm -hmm. uh, the supports aren't there. Whatever, we're going to change. We're going to make change for every child, no matter race, sex income level, whatever, all kids deserve the ability to read. That's, uh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And, and your next your next poem, we are a next poem, your next painting, uh, We Love to Read. Mm -hmm. So I created We Love to Read for the Florida Reading Association. So the Florida Reading Association at the time was having their 50th year anniversary. So hidden up in the trees, you see the word 50 years, uh, we love to read. Uh, down, down at the bottom, uh, 1962 to 2012, that's their 50 years. And then you see the night uh, changing today and the, and the seasons changing from fall to spring to kind of indicate, indicate the passing of time. Uh, that was a fun piece to create. The Florida Reading Association was very happy with it. I'm happy when they're happy. When I create a piece of artwork for an organization, they come to me and say, George, can you create for this? And I say, yes, I create three sketches. And I say, take a look at these three sketches. And which one do you think I'm headed in the, in the right direction with? Which one do you think is most saying what you wanted to say. And they'll say, oh, George, we like sketch number two, but can you add this from sketch number one? And can you add, and I can make those changes until it's time for me to start putting the color down. Once I start putting paint or pastel down, I don't want to make any changes. It's right. kind of difficult at that point. But the Florida Reading Association was very happy with that piece. I was happy with it. It still sells as well today as it did when I did it back in 2012. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful, nice. beautiful painting. Thank you. And, and my favorite, um, I, I, I say my favorite, they're all, I, I mean, each one of them really has a special meaning when I see them and I'm like, oh, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. <laughs> you know, I mean, this one really, like I said before, it really speaks to me. It's Thank each you. one, teach one. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, I actually want to buy a copy of this for my house. <laughs> I mean, this is this is an amazing, amazing piece. Oh, thank you. If you follow the the architecture, the way it arcs around, and then it comes down to the two I individuals on the left and right, you kind of see that heart. And then if you look down on the floor, uh, you can start to find words that are kind of hidden into the camouflage, into the artwork. But it is the spirit. It, it, that's the overall thing that I want people to take away from that piece of artwork is the spirit of the artwork. It, it is truly there with the underlying meaning of love one another, that we love our children when we, like you said, bring them that knowledge and, and that hope. It, it, the other piece that I, I love about it is the multicultural aspect of you know all of the different races of kids that are in there and they're all enjoying each other enjoying books mm -hmm. and for the most part that's what we see in our classrooms also mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. however once we I don't know why once we get to being adults we don't emulate that but we have to get back to that right we have mm -hmm. to be we have to get back to that reaching out to somebody of a different race or a different religion or a different this or that and and getting to know them and go, you know, who is George? I want to know George. I want to <laughs> hear about George, right? right? I want to know what makes George tick. I think the greatest compliment that I ever received behind my artwork was a lady came up to my booth and she told me, George, if Martin Luther King Jr., were an artist, this is the artwork that he would create. And I have kept that always. I thought that was such a great compliment that we have to learn how to emulate our children in that respect. Children love 
everybody. And that's the beauty that's inside of our children. We teach them to not love each other. We teach them reasons to dis this person or that person. But the natural inclination of a child is to love each other, to love one another. A friend, a good friend of mine is a kindergarten teacher, and she shares that with me all the time and how one of the little girls had a dollar bill, and she wanted to share the dollar with her friends so that they could get ice cream when they went into the lunchroom. And so her way to do it was to tear it and give each person a piece of that dollar. And she said when she walked in and they were all in the line, they were all waving their little piece of the dollar. <laughs> and I thought that was so cute, you know. But look at how beautiful that is. Look how sincere that is. Right. That, that's what we need in society to learn that we're all the same. Inside, we are all the same. There, there's no one that's any different than anyone else. We all want the same things. We all want the same for our children. We all want to learn. And if we could learn to live our lives the way the children do, then the world would be a 100% better place. And that's why, you know, one of our mantras is if I have to work this hard to make sure that my kids get it, I'm doing it for all kids. It doesn't take me any more effort to advocate for all children than it does for my child. Right, right. And I know that there's children out there that may not either have parents or may not have somebody with the knowledge to advocate for them. For them. So like you said, it's our duty, it's our responsibility to make sure that those kids get exactly what they need. Mm -hmm. I am creating a piece right now for the Florida Adoptive Parent Association. They will take this piece of artwork and frame it and give it out as a award to adoptive and foster parents. Uh, so the challenge for me is to create a piece of artwork. If you're familiar with any foster fam families, they tend to be very biracial, interracial. So. Uh, the mom is white, the child is black, the father is Hispanic, everybody's mixed up in there. But what happens is it's just love. They don't see it like the same. They're able to see past that. I think you have to see it, but you have to also embrace it. So if I am a white father and I am raising a Hispanic child, that I know he's Hispanic. It's not that I don't see that. And I want him to embrace his culture as well as, as mine and anyone else's. So I want to teach him about uh, his history as well as my own. But I want him also to know that I love him. Uh, and I want him to love one another, each other, for who and, and what we are. So my challenge in creating this piece of artwork that they will use as an award will be to come up with a piece that embraces all cultures and all races and that shows love for everyone. And so when I sit down in my art studio, I think of all the people who I have interacted with Right now, during this time of COVID-19, I can't get out and do the conferences that I'm typically used to doing. I do two and three conferences every month uh, during the normal time, and I meet a lot of people. People come up to my table, and they tell me their stories, and, and there's so much inspiration there and so much love that they kind of put on me. Then when I go back to my art studio, it's very easy to come up with a piece of artwork just based on the inspiration I received from the people I've been surrounded by. And that's every kind of person you can imagine that will come up to my table and talk to me. And, and I think that's so beautiful, but that's where I get my inspiration from. That's what I take back to the studio. And inevitably, I will come up with something. Sometime I knock it out the park. Sometime I got to work at it a little bit harder. 
Uh, but I enjoy doing what I do. I, I truly do. I think that this is what God would have me to do. Well, I can I can say uh, your work is amazing. Um, I th you. As you said, I think, you know, your pieces of art should hang in every school across the country. Um, there is there is very deep, deep meaning behind it. And your artwork comes from a place of love and understanding and caring uh, at the highest level. Thank you. And Thank you. and I for one appreciate all of all of what you do, your advocacy work, your you know, working with children um, through art. It, it's 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 just beautiful. And you know, I'll I'll throw this out to our listeners and our, our viewers. Um, I want you to go out to George's website. It's www.gemartstudio.com. Again, that's www.gemartstudio, A-R-T-S-T-U-D-I-O Studio. All of his artwork is very, very affordable. I want you to go out there and purchase one of his pieces. Let's purchase some of these pieces and, and donate them to the school so that they're hanging in the school so that these kids get to see it. Ziggy, can you bring up his, his website, www.gemartstudios.com? I, again, I, George, I want to buy the, one of the pieces, uh, each one. Uh, teach, one. teach one, bringing down the walls of literacy. When you go to the website and you click on gallery, the pieces will come up and you can scroll down there. I believe they're in alphabetical order. If you click on a piece, then it'll open up again and it'll tell you a little bit about who I created it for and when I created it, uh, the organization that uh, commissioned the artwork. And uh, I, I just enjoy doing what I'm doing. I, I like as artists, I like Norman Rockwell. I, I admire his artwork. I like, I like Pablo Picasso, mostly because Pablo was probably the most uh, prolific artist ever. He created, they say, over 30,000 pieces of artwork. Uh, to me, that's almost unfathomable. How did you create so much artwork? You know, it takes me uh, forever to get through one, but but I would like to be like that. I would like to be able to create more and more often and as much as uh, your listeners can help me, that will keep me in my art studio, keep me from running well, around. Well, being that October is Dyslexia Awareness Month, um, uh, you know, we need to we need to support those that support us. And you know, I'm 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 definitely making this uh, call out to everybody in our our uh, communities to reach out to George and you know purchase one of his paintings. Um, George, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. I am so honored that um, I know that you're getting ready to go home. Uh, that you took the time to to come talk. Um, it was such an honor to have you here. It really was. Thank you so much. Again, thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for reaching out. I appreciate you. Um, please be sure to like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, leave us a comment. We love to hear from our listeners and our viewers. Uh, and again, you can download our podcast on any of the platforms. We're on all of them. And at the end of every show, we like to recommend that if your child is struggling in school and you think there's a possibility of a learning disability, please don't wait. Please make sure that you go to our website and download the template to get the testing process, process started. It's www.empowerdyslexia.info. Again, download the template. You can turn this into your school counselor and get the testing uh, process started you'll be very uh, relieved and you know, 
to understand what's going on with your child and what help we can provide for them at that point, and your child will also. Um, I mean, knowing is half the battle. I mean, we've, we've heard that growing up. It's, it is something we have to do. Don't wait. Please don't wait. Um, thank you for tuning in each and every week. It is such an honor to do these shows for, you know, the community. This is our show. This is all of our shows. This, this isn't my show. It's all of us. So thank you for being a part of it. Thank you for the support. Um, until next week, we'll see you there. And here is a word from our sponsors. Learning Ally is a proud sponsor of the Empowered Dyslexia podcast. At Learning Ally, we are always looking for new ways to engage readers struggling with a reading deficit like dyslexia and help them work to their potential. Visit www.learningally.org to learn about the Learning Ally audiobook solution, including which of your students are eligible for access. If you live in Texas, we have great news. The Texas Education Agency provides access to the Learning Ally audiobook solution for all K-12 public and charter school students with reading deficits. Get started today by visiting www.learningally.org.